the museum was anthropological in the obsolete style, and I could see the fluidity of the categories. On the one hand, of black, primitive, and native cultures, and on the other, the clusters of chimpanzee, mandrel, and gorilla families in the taxidermy displays in the adjacent hall. The context making the continuity between human and animal all but explicit, and I became even more strongly aware that the halls were full of children and young people having their heads passively stuffed with obscenities that would, in the future and in some other context, draw on, that they would, in the future and in some other context, draw on to shape their interactions with people from distant countries. <laughs> Period. <laughs> The light was low in the big old rooms, but the displays were spotlit, and I was drawn in not just by the fossilized ideas about color, race, and kinship, but also by the dioramas which brought to mind a friend whose father in the 1950s had been employed in building just such dead life and living death chambers. The animals stuffed and mounted with painted backgrounds, the amazing antelopes, greater kudu, elands, rhinos and zebras, the dinosaur bones, which were seamlessly falsified with casts and which testified to long vanished violent struggles for survival, and above all the study cases full of stuffed birds, endless varieties of birds in the subtle coloration common to these inhabitants of the air, the spots, flecks, stripes, couple color, the grays, browns, gray browns, brown grays, yellowish whites, whites, blacks, and faded reds and greens with dull yellow daubs where the eyes once were. Period. Looking at these long dead creepers, swallows, sparrows, wrens, nuthatches, thrushes, egrets, gulls, jays, diving ducks, titmice, crows, as well as the falcons, vultures, eagles, and all the surprising varieties of hawks, their feathers smoothed and folded, their feet tucked in beneath them so that each looked as though it were diving into water, I felt at moments the sensation of a bird pulsing in my enclosed hands like a feathery heart, and at other moments of myself turning into a bird and plunging heedlessly across the air with avian single-mindedness. And when I encounter the case full of owls, those marvelous night hunters who surpass us in sensitivity as master musicians do the tone deaf, who, blindfolded, hunt mice by the sound of their scampering, their white tufted faces out in some far region beyond secrets and the divulging of secrets, angelic, with all the terror the word implied, I was ready to believe anything, accept and endure anything for their sakes, ready to hand myself over as an uncomplaining servant of the natural world, particularly the world of the feathered, beaked and winged creatures and this must have been why I thought that night, that I thought later that night, that the old air hoop player I encountered in the subway at Grand Street, as shriveled and trembly as his instrument, and the picking opera singer who sang beside him, her voice thin and bright, her lipstick thin and bright, were also the image of marvelous unnamed birds who had somehow been captured by the mind's eye in the middle of their flight right in the middle of their swift and breathtaking flight. So that's that story. And um, I'm going to, spoiler alert. This is how Open City ends. And the people who have read it are like, it doesn't really give away too much. The narrator is a young Nigerian-German psychiatrist called Julius. Within a few minutes of our entering the upper bay, we saw the Statue of Liberty, a faint green in the mist, then very quickly massive and towering over us, a monument worthy of the name, with the thick folds of her dress as stately as columns. The boat came close to the island, and more of the students had by now moved up onto the deck, and they pointed, and their voices which filled the air around us, fell echolessly into the water. 
The cruise organizer came up to me. Glad you came, aren't you? I acknowledged his greeting with a faint smile, and he, sensing my solitude, went away again. The crown of the statue has remained closed since late 2001, and even those visitors who come close to it are confined to look upward at the statue. No one is permitted to climb up the 354 narrow steps and look out into the bay from the windows in the crown. Bartholdi's monumental statue has not, in any case, done particularly long service as a destination for tourists. Although it had its symbolic value right from the beginning, until 1902, it was a working lighthouse, the biggest in the country. In those days, the flame that shone from the torch-guided ships into Manhattan's harbor, that same light, especially in bad weather, fatally disoriented birds. The birds, many of which were clever enough to dodge the cluster of skyscrapers in the city, somehow lost their bearings when faced with a single monumental flame. A large number of birds met their death in this manner. In 1888, for instance, on the morning after one particularly stormy night, more than 1,400 dead birds were recovered from the crown, the balcony of the torch, and the pedestal of the statue. The officials of the island saw an opportunity there, and as was their custom, sold the birds off at low cost to New York City milliners and fancy stores. But it was to be the last time that they would do so because one Colonel Tassin, who had military command of the island, intervened and was determined that any birds that happened to die in the future would not be disposed of commercially, but would be retained in the service of science. The carcasses, each time 200 or more of them had been gathered, were to be sent to the Washington National Museum, the Smithsonian Institution, and other scientific institutions. With this strong instinct for public spiritedness, Colonel Tassin undertook a government system of records which he ensured were kept with military regularity. And shortly afterward, he was able to deliver detailed reports on each death, including the species of the bird, date, hour of striking, number striking, number killed, direction and force of the wind, character of the weather, and general remarks. On October 1 of that year, for example, the colonel's report indicated that 50 rails had died, as had 11 wrens, two catbirds, and one whip-poor will. The following day, the record showed two dead wrens, the day after that, eight wrens. The average Colonel Tassin estimated was about 20 birds per night, although the weather and the direction of the wind had a great deal to do with the resulting harvest. Nevertheless, the sense persisted that something more troubling was at work. On the morning of October 13, for example, 175 wrens had been gathered in, all dead of the impact, although the night just passed hadn't been particularly windy or dark. 